The Soviet Communist Party has not faced a serious internal threat to its political rule since the 1920s. Yet, after years of forced sacrifices by the population, shortages of food and clothing persist. Housing remains inadequate. Intellectual and artistic expression are stifled. And growing corruption reaches into all levels of society. The Soviet people respond with public displays of cynicism, but they almost never openly challenge the authority of the leadership. The Soviet regime does not hesitate to enforce its rule through the violent suppression of individual liberty, but it prefers to use less onerous methods of control, such as various propaganda techniques. The use of propaganda from cradle to grave by the Kremlin has helped to ensure at least the passive acceptance of its rule by the Soviet people. The Soviet regime disseminates propaganda through a vast network operating under the supervision of the party's Central Committee and Politburo. This propaganda network encompasses over 4,000 newspapers, a large book publishing empire, a nationwide radio and television system, and an incessant stream of public lectures. For example, about 15 million lectures are given each year by the Knowledge Society, a major component of the propaganda network. The regime also works through mass public organizations such as the Communist Youth League and trade unions, the agitation and propaganda component of the armed forces, and the national educational system to indoctrinate various elements of the population. Moreover, party propaganda professionals are dispatched continuously to enforce ideological conformity within the vast network and to provide the appropriate party line. Socialist indoctrination, Soviet style, is introduced early in a child's education. Each classroom contains its own Lenin corner, a small area set up to deify the exploits of Lenin as the great leader of the first socialist revolution in the world. In music class, for example, children learn to express their love for Lenin through hymns that are sung on holidays. Soviet elementary education is characterized by a suffocating paternalism. An assurance of personal security is offered by the state in return for strict conformity and the suppression of individual expression. In art classes, for example, all children are required to draw the same object in exactly the same way and using the same colors. Also, there is no ambiguity for Soviet school children. There are only right and wrong answers, and repetition of the so-called right answer is the basis of Soviet learning. In this manner, the natural spontaneity of Soviet children is sternly but gently controlled by the teacher, and thereby guided along the path of socialist behavior considered proper by the state. Individuality has always been discouraged in Russia. The head or patriarch of the family set the rules of behavior, and dissent by other members was not tolerated. This pattern has been continued by the state. Soviet citizens are continuing the tradition and are encouraged from childhood to suppress their individual aspirations in favor of collective or state interests. As a result, they often appear to be fearful of individual expression and many have grown dependent on a paternalistic government which is more than willing to make decisions for them. But the leadership's dream of a socialist society where everyone works in unison to build communism and where discipline and order are self-imposed seems more distant than ever. Because of this, the regime is compelled to issue an endless stream of rules and regulations in an effort to direct the lives of the Soviet people. As one wit summed it up, what's not forbidden is compulsory. The people have become adept, however, at getting around the regulations and knowing which rules to break and which to obey. In recent years, Soviet leaders have become increasingly concerned over a growing popular rejection of collective social responsibility and a trend toward the private pursuit of individual activities such as jazz, religion, underground art, and the second economy. 
The regime has responded by stepping up efforts to reduce contacts with the West and has launched a propaganda campaign to persuade the population that such contacts are antisocial. And it goes out of its way to praise those workers who allegedly devote their labor to the aims of Soviet society at the expense of private goals. In fact, Soviet television regularly offers generous portions of good news regarding the achievements of ordinary citizens, often depicting them as heroes. The leadership is well aware that the welfare-oriented features of the system are those that have brought the most positive response from the people. Consequently, the regime gives heavy publicity to improvements in the standard of living and plays down public suspicions that the Soviet economy has stagnated in recent years. While admitting that the Soviet Union lags behind the West in providing consumer goods, its propaganda machine explains this by saying that Russia had been a backward country at the time of the revolution, and that progress toward the socialist idea had been halted by World War II. In no way does the regime blame its problems on deficiencies in the system. At the same time, propaganda plays on the high priority many Soviet citizens place on personal security by claiming that the distribution of income, education, and health benefits are more equitable than in capitalist countries. To underscore this claim, the regime points to the lack of job security and the existence of unemployment in Western market economies. The propaganda machine also exploits crime statistics from Western countries and makes it appear that the U.S. in particular is a lawless society where the individual's physical security is constantly at risk. The Soviet media go to great lengths to portray the leadership as thoroughly committed to the welfare of the common man. Shortcomings in the supply of consumer goods are attributed to individual cases of managerial inefficiency and corruption on the part of lower level functionaries. The leadership provides excuses and scapegoats for its economic problems in an effort to deflect criticism from higher officials and the communist system. The identification of Russian nationalism with Soviet communism is an important aspect of Soviet propaganda. Perhaps the achievements of the Soviet Union since the revolution have been purchased at such great personal and national sacrifice. The Soviet Union's status as a world power allows the regime to draw from a deep well in the Russian personality, love of country. The leadership has played on this impulse with a considerable degree of success. And by cleverly tying Russian nationalism to Soviet communism has produced Soviet patriotism. The result is an important social bond, even among some members of non-Russian national minority groups. In this vein, the party fully utilizes propaganda to exaggerate the achievements of the Soviet Union while portraying Soviet involvement in the Third World as benevolent aid to developing countries who are trying to escape from so-called Western imperialism. The most powerful expression of Soviet patriotism derives from the defeat of Nazi Germany in World War II. That victory provides a seemingly inexhaustible source of pride in the average citizen. The party, of course, identifies itself with that great achievement by portraying the war as a struggle on behalf of the sacred motherland by the heroic Soviet people under the guidance of the Communist Party. This theme will receive even greater emphasis during the 40th anniversary celebration of Germany's defeat in May 1985. The regime also has received considerable propaganda benefit from the Soviet Union's exploits in space and in international sports competition, and often attributes these achievements to the superiority of socialism. Sports, moreover, is seen as an outlet for popular energies and a distraction from the hardships of daily life. The Soviet Union has often been referred to in the West as a closed society, and the regime's ability to insulate the population from exposure to foreign information and ideas not only confirms this notion, but provides it with a major prop for the Soviet system. Xenophobic nationalism was not discovered by the Bolsheviks, however. It has its roots in old Russia. 
Throughout Russian history, contacts with foreigners were discouraged, and it was practically impossible for a foreigner to live or operate a business in the country. Until 1703, all domestic and foreign news was deemed a state secret, and foreign news has been regarded with deep suspicion ever since. In recent years, however, expanded contacts with the West and technological improvements in modern communications have weakened the regime's control of information. Soviet citizens today have greater access to information from abroad, particularly through radio broadcasts and from unofficial sources within their own country. And this has enabled them to compare their standard of living to other standards and therefore to become more aware of alternatives to the Soviet system. For this reason, the Soviet regime in recent years has increasingly sought to make its propaganda more credible in order to counter the influence of Western ideas. Since Brezhnev's death, Moscow has tended to release more information on a selective basis about the proceedings of official Soviet organs such as the Politburo and to hold periodic Western-style news conferences. By releasing more information about foreign and domestic events, the regime can put its own interpretation on these events, and thereby combat what the population hears from Western sources. The regime made a particularly vigorous effort in this regard following the downing of KAL Flight 007 in 1983. While this propaganda effort appeared to backfire in the West, Soviet citizens, to judge from reporting of Western embassy officials, accepted the Soviet's version as correct. Party leader Konstantin Chernyenko has called for an increased counter-propaganda campaign to resist what he calls the full-scale information and propaganda invasion launched by the United States against the Soviet Union. This campaign features greater vigilance against the alleged efforts of Western propaganda to undermine the USSR internally. In addition, Soviet counter-propaganda denigrates all dimensions of life in the West, charges the United States with acting to increase the danger of nuclear war, and accuses Washington of engaging in a wide variety of transgressions in the international arena. These allegations include fomenting terrorism in the Third World, supporting the apartheid policy in South Africa, and establishing hegemony over Latin America. At the same time, the regime has acted more vigorously to suppress unofficial sources of information within the country, such as underground publications, and to reduce the population's susceptibility to foreign news by jamming foreign radio broadcasts and by limiting contacts between Soviet citizens and foreigners. In this regard, the regime has increased its efforts to reinforce a psychology of distrust of foreigners and to equate any criticism of the Soviet system with disloyalty to the motherland. In fact, Moscow has recently broadened the definition of treason in a way that makes virtually any association with foreign residents suspect. The most ruthless propaganda, however, is reserved for the Soviet dissidents, those who openly and brazenly dare to challenge the regime's authority. No effort is spared to isolate, ridicule, and publicly humiliate such individuals. Given the reaction to this treatment by the average Soviet citizen, which is manifested by either silence or outright support for the government, the regime has largely succeeded in portraying the dissidents as disloyal and fully deserving imprisonment and exile. Furthermore, the regime often compels any defector who returns to the Soviet Union to publicly denounce his or her decision to leave and to denigrate the West as an undesirable place to live. The return of Stalin's daughter Svetlana is a good case in point, and the television interview with Oleg Bitov who defected and returned is another vivid example. The regime also glorifies the KGB and the border guards, picturing them as heroes who protect the country from foreign subversion. Such propaganda is intended not only as indoctrination, but also as intimidation to remind the people that the state is fully capable of repressing those who step out of line. 
In sum, Soviet citizens do not buy all that the official media tell them. Their daily experiences demonstrate to them the falsity of much Soviet propaganda. Even when it is not believed, however, propaganda is a powerful instrument of manipulation for the regime. It defines the limits of permissible discussion and sets parameters on what is considered legitimate and what will not be